The big one is an Aero Hypercoaster that opened back in 1994 and as of when this video is being made is England's tallest roller coaster. Now that will soon be overthrown by Hyperia at Thorpe Park, but that means it took about 30 years for Big One's record to be broken. That's incredible. The ride runs right up alongside the edge of the park. When you look off to the left, you see the Irish Sea, the beach out in front of you. It's a great location for a roller coaster. Got some really impressive stats, 213 feet tall, 74 miles per hour, 5,497 feet long. It's one of those roller coasters that everyone in England knows about, even if it's not necessarily for the best reasons. While the coaster certainly has a strong fan base, it also has a bit of a sour reputation. Those who love the big one, love it, and those who hate the big one, hate it. So this is gonna be my full in-depth review of the attraction. I'm gonna tell you which side of the coin I fall on, walk you through the different elements on this ride that work, and also talk about what does not work. But first, a little bit of history. As I mentioned, the ride opened in 1994. That was five years after Cedar Point opened up Magnum XL 200. That was the first complete circuit roller coaster to break the 200 foot barrier and Blackpool Pleasure Beach saw that and said, we want the same thing, but bigger. Following that success, Arrow was on a bit of a kick putting in these hyper style coasters. They opened Steel Phantom at Kennywood in 1991, which features a 228 foot tall drop. Desperado opened up at Buffalo Bills the same year as the big one, 1994. But while Steel Phantom got completely redone and Desperado remains standing but not operating, Big One continues to operate to this day. The park has done a really nice job taking care of it, even going as far as retracking certain sections. You can really see that in this on-ride footage where it goes from that faded red to this part is a lot shinier, clearly newer. Obviously, those familiar with Arrow know that that company went bankrupt after they did X2 at Six Flags Magic Mountain, so the retracking was done by an English company. They did a great job replicating the track, so I appreciate the care that has been put into this attraction. Does that save it, though, from completely beating you up the whole time? Well, stay tuned to find out. As you board your train, these are your typical Aero Hypercoaster style vehicles. Three rows per car, 30 passengers per train. A pretty simple lap bar if you've ridden Magnum XL at Cedar Point or Gemini also at Cedar Point. Same restraint. When you dispatch out of the station, you're going to take a right-hand turn and pass through this big Pepsi Max tube. Up until 2011, the big one was known as Pepsi Max Big One, part of a sponsorship deal that eventually got dropped, but they left this product placement still there. You emerge from the tube and start up your lift hill, nice and loud, click clack all the way up to the top. As I mentioned, 213 feet in the air. I love the view of the park from up here. This would be a sick lift walk. One thing you're immediately going to notice about Big One is that it interacts with many of the other attractions here in the park, including Icon, whose top hat passes directly underneath the lift hill of Big One. And you got plenty of time to take in that view. And when you reach the top and you start to crest over, this is where things get spooky. From the front row, you can't see the first drop. You're at the top and you see the beach, but nothing else. What happens is the big one drops in such a way that you really can't see what's about to happen until you're staring straight down. The actual angle of descent is 65 degrees, but I'll go ahead and say it, it feels steeper than that. This is an absolutely demented first drop, especially when you're in the back. The front is scary because you can't see it, but in the back, you just get pulled over it at crazy speeds. The train is like already halfway down the drop by the time you're cresting over, and Big One throws you in such a way where you start off level and then get yanked to the right. Be careful with whoever you're sitting next to because this ride is so aggressive, you're probably going to slam into them. In my situation, Sarah was right next to me and her arm whacked me in the face. I almost lost my sunglasses. Normally on roller coasters, I love sitting in the back because of the drop, but on the big one, I think the back is too much. I think I actually prefer the front on here. It's more manageable. This drop is absolutely insane. It's by far the most memorable thing about the coaster, but not necessarily in a good way. I don't think I really liked it. Like I'm all about roller coasters pushing my body to the limits, but I think I found the limit. And it's crazy that this is what Arrow came up with in 1994. I mean, I know the times were different back then. I'm not even sure they were using computers to design this thing, but you just don't get drops like that nowadays. And part of what makes this drop insane is that big one is not smooth. It has a lot of jank to it. You feel every bump, every kink, every imperfection on those trains. Especially beware of the wheel seats. If you're sitting in the third row of any car, it is significantly worse. So I do not recommend the back row. I would say if you want to experience it in the back, do the second to back row. Way more enjoyable. Now, moving on from that absolutely insane drop, how do you follow it up? with a bunch of ramps. While Magnum throws in a ton of airtime hills that send you up out of your seat, the big one has been nicknamed the monorail because you're just gliding up at a very gradual ascent. You hit a peak, doesn't really do anything, 
and then you ramp back down. And that's what most of this layout is. It is not terribly exciting. These hills don't really do anything. The big one has a lot of track to it, but most of it is uneventful. And I think with this, that someone could easily pull up the argument, well, listen, it's 1994. Roller coasters have obviously gotten a lot better since then. And you know what? You're absolutely right. But here's the thing. At this point in time, Arrow had already done Magnum. And while that ride is not perfect, it is at least eventful. Those hills are exciting. The quote unquote ramps are way less drawn out. You actually get airtime, which is something that does not really exist on the big one. But that doesn't mean that it's good for nothing. I like the turnaround right here. It's nice and panoramic. Again, not terribly exciting. You actually remain flat pretty much the entire time, but it's nice for the view. While much of the ride feels rough, these retract sections definitely feel a bit better. It's still not amazing, but it is an improvement. A lot of this retracking work was specifically done in the valleys, which is helpful because those are typically the roughest parts of the ride. So I like that they tried to fix that up. I can also appreciate all the different near misses with the supports and the structures from other rides, such as Nickelodeon Street coming up soon, as well as Steeplechase. I mentioned Icon earlier. So like that aspect of it is great. Following this out and back section, you get towards the end of the ride and you're gonna rise up into the mid-course brake run. And this profiling entering this brake run is just so messed up. Like, it is whack, guys. They gotta do something about this. You just aggressively jolt up into the mid-course. You take a bit of a breather. You're like, is it over now? Well, no, it is not. You drop off into a helix. This part is very reminiscent of Magnum's turnaround. Like, it's just kind of going around, not really sure what it's doing. The profiling is all over the place. Then after that, you drop off into a tunnel, and before you enter the brick run, you got one more messed up section of track, jolts you up into a final stop. It is a really long ride, however... I do not feel that this is a very re-rideable experience. Which is funny because we actually met people when we were at Blackpool Pleasure Beach who have ridden this thing like thousands of times. They'll go to the park and just sit on this thing all day and I do not understand how anyone could do that. Like props to you for having a high tolerance for this thing. But I think we did three or four rides in on this back to back and I was done. I was like, I don't need to ride this thing again for a long time. It was more than enough for me especially in the back row. Following that, I was like, I need to sit down. I need to take a break. Objectively, looking at the layout, it's not good. Like, don't get me wrong. I can absolutely appreciate the ride for its historical significance, its cultural impact that it had on people, but it is not a coaster I think highly of. I think you could make an argument that the best aero coaster in the park is Revolution, the small aero coaster sitting right next to it. That one at least includes some airtime and the vertical loop is fun and I like going backwards. What makes Big One cool is just the sheer size of it, right? Especially for locals, they probably haven't experienced what like a true modern hyper coaster could look like. It's just wild to me how far technology has come. Like literally five years after Blackpool Pleasure Beach opened the big one, B&M debuted Apollo's Chariot at Busch Gardens Williamsburg, which is much smoother and actually has some airtime. An actual re-rideable coaster. But despite all that, the big one still gets lines. People want to come out and ride it. I will say though, definitely be mindful of weather when you come here to Blackpool. The big one especially is susceptible to high winds. I know during their morning testing, they'll weight this thing down with sandbags to make sure it doesn't valley at the turnaround. If they're worried it's going to valley, they won't load the back of the train at all. They'll say, yeah, you have to sit in the front half. So your ride experiences here are going to vary drastically depending on when you go. I've ridden the big one on two different occasions, and I found that it definitely ran faster the first time I went. It was hot out, blue skies. In this footage right here, this is much more recent. You can see we're all wearing jackets, so it's a little breezy out. So that's what makes some of these turnaround moments and hills even more uneventful as you're not moving through them super fast. But let's talk final scores. And this one's a little tricky because in the world of hyper coasters, this is actually one of my least favorites. I don't really care for it. I'll ride it every time I go to Blackpool just because it's one of those things that you gotta do, but it doesn't mean I like it. But do I hate it? No, like on a scale of one to 10, I don't think it deserves a two or a one. But if five is the middle ground where I'm just kinda eh about it, then I'd say the big one deserves a four. But that is my personal opinion. I've also ridden a lot of roller coasters. And when I'd done Magnum so many times, coming here to then do Big One, I think just made me enjoy it even less. I don't particularly love Magnum. However, when they're in the same class of roller coasters built around the same time frame, one is just significantly better than the other. There's no arguing that. Is Big One better than Desperado though? Well, tough to say. I only rode Desperado once and I didn't really like that one either. 
so I'd probably put them in the same range. But I'm curious to hear what all of your thoughts are on the big one. I know this coaster can be divisive, so do you agree with the points that I brought up? Is there anything that you really like about it that you think I missed? If you're one of those people that loves to lap the big one all day, what do you love about it? I'd love to hear what keeps you coming back down below. If you're new to the channel, I'd love if you could subscribe. We do coaster reviews from places all across the world. So stay tuned for more. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.